I was reading our interview from a year ago. Okay. And if you, you may or may not recall, we spent a lot of time, as you might expect, on streaming. Yes. And on the changing landscape for obvious reasons. Here we are a year later, and I guess I want to start there again. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. It's happening. Right. Disney Plus is launched. Um, HBO Max, we have a price on. Right. We've watched Netflix sort of waver a little bit, at least in the stock market, uh, and with some subscriber oh, metrics. Um, so I guess my question would be, given the landscape that we keep talking about changing quickly, who do you think is best positioned right now? Well, I think if you were asking me who, who's going to be around and strong five years from now, I would say for sure uh, Disney and Netflix. Okay, Disney because they have terrific content and tons of it and a great brand globally. So I think their challenge is to get people's credit cards. They have no large direct consumer relationship, so they're going to have to piggyback on the backs of people who do, like Verizon. Or So that's going to be a area by area, group by group, in order to uh, get that direct consumer relationship in scale. Uh, Netflix, you know, is, uh, is so far in the lead. They have such a big uh, base and revenue stream that they'll be around. They, they may not be as profitable as they would have been if there was no big competition, driving up the cost of content and dividing to some degree the available revenue stream. Uh, I think Apple's going to surprise everybody with the, n the numbers they achieve in a short period of time. You do? Why do well, you think that? Well, I think even though they're thin on content, really thin. their distribution strategy of essentially anybody who buys anything from Apple gets a free trial for a year, and, uh, and of course Apple already has their credit card. So when you start with 460 million credit cards or 460 million consumer relationships. 1.4 billion devices or some. And, and you give them something for free and they get to use it for a year and then they put it on your, on your bill. Uh, that's, that's a very uh, interesting way to get large numbers fast. And of course, it's chicken and egg. As they get large numbers, then they can gauge what people like, what people don't like. They can go out and acquire or build more content. Right. So their approach is content light, uh, wonderful mass distribution strategy. Disney, content heavy, right? Needing some way to get consumers to take an action uh, that gives them a, a relationship. So th those are the two entrants uh, going at each other. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that, uh, that HBO will, will continue to be a decent service in the U.S., but I don't see that they have the revenue stream potentially to, uh, to match what Netflix can spend. Obviously, Amazon with Prime has an entirely different monetization approach, so you could expect uh, Jeff to step on the accelerator or the brake in terms of how much content he's willing to buy and give away to support Prime. And, you know, I think it's not his primary business. I mean, it's not. So, uh, you know, the free shipping is very powerful, a lot of glue. Uh, content that's unique is kind of a marketing tool for that. And I think they're spending he's, an awful lot of money to, yeah, on content right now. As a percentage of the value of Prime, right? You know, right. But I would especially if you believe that they don't need to sustain it indefinitely. No, I mean I know there's factions within the company who say, why don't we? We could. This could all go right to the bottom line. Would we really lose any Prime customers? I think Amazon evolves to be a bundler of other people's services. Uh, with with less of their own and more of other people's. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think ultimately everybody, all the tech guys would really like to be the platform and let other people waste their money on content, right? Because the real, the real payday is the relationship with the customer, the information about the customer, and being a gateway uh, 
And, and that's where the, I think ultimately the tech companies want to go. I want to go through, the, you hit a lot of the names, but I'd like to go a little deeper on each of them. You know, a year ago you were talking to me at, at the time about Apple and your expectation that they would, because it was before we'd seen yeah. anything really, right. uh, that they would come to play. Um, mm -hmm. They started with, I don't know, 13, 14 shows. I mean, it's yeah. really virtually nothing. Yeah. But do you think that they're going to continue to ramp up spending to your point that as they watch in terms of how many relationships they actually get, do, are they committed to this, do you think? Well, I think it's, they have optionality with this, right? I mean, they, they're they gonna get out there six, eight months down the road. They're gonna look at how many people uh, have signed up or, or potentially signed up. They'll do the arithmetic backwards right. and decide you know, how much they can afford to spend on content. And if it looks like a go for them, like that they can, can uh, include video in some kind of a bundle that includes music and all their other games. And, you know, I think they want to be a bundler and a platform, right? Uh, and, and video could be an important component of that. And, and this gives them a relatively inexpensive look at whether or not adding a video component adds value to the bundle that they can offer and glue and pricing power. And if it does, then they can step on the accelerator uh, and either buy or, or, or create more content. Right. Uh, on Disney, um, a year ago you'd expressed a similar question about their credit card relationships. Correct. And also on the technology side, you had mm -hmm. said then you wanted to sort of see what it looked like. Yeah. We kind of have an answer on that, and obviously out of the box, the, the, the service has done quite well, it would seem, with over 10 million subscribers. The Verizon relationship certainly being helpful there. Yeah, you'd love to see a breakdown of how many of those are direct consumers, you know, going to their website and signing up and how many are essentially uh, indirect through the Verizon relationship or other similar uh, third-party relationships. Uh, I, I think, I have no question that Disney will be successful with this. The quality of their content, the, uh, the strength of their brand, and frankly, the quality of their management. I think they've got their eye on something three, four, five years out. And, uh, you know, in the end, I think they'll be quite successful. You know, John, are you surprised? They seem to be getting not just a pass, but rewarded by their shareholder base right now. Um, they're pulling content from different places. I mean, I know, for example, Comcast, my parent company, which yeah. owns Sky, they pull their, their relationship with Sky. Sky's paying them yeah. hundreds of millions of pounds for stuff. They're no longer paying them for it. Well, it, yeah. Well, uh, you know, Bob is all in on this. I mean, they have a very clear vision of where the future is. Uh, they, you know, they've gotten beat up for a number of years by the, the court, quote, unquote, cord cutters dropping ESPN. So they think it's inevitable that they're going to have to go to uh, direct consumer relationships. There was also that period when Netflix market cap was bigger than Disney's. Yep. Now which it's I thought was size. a little silly, <laughs> but but uh, still the message was there. The street gets it. You know, if you have direct consumer relationship in scale with growth and your pricing power, uh, it's pretty powerful. It's a very powerful business model. Uh, and finally, you mentioned HBO Max. I'd, I'd like to get a little more sense from you as to your thoughts there. Fourteen ninety nine is the price, very similar to what you pay for HBO right now. But they seem to be encouraging people, in a sense, to disconnect from the cable provider and go well, go the broadband route. Right. Um, you question their ability to spend enough to sort of compete. Well, I, I think when when Randall started looking at Time Warner as a solution for driving his services. Uh, you know, HBO was the king of the hill, spending about two, mil two billion a year on content. Domestic, primarily domestic. They have a little bit of international, not much. You know, that was the biggest budget, you know, and had been the biggest budget in pay TV for years. All of a sudden, bang, right? So, so the way I look at it, in the U.S., if you wanted HBO, you already have HBO, right? So I don't see that they gain a lot of new customers. They might transition some existing ones, 
so that so that they don't have the wholesale discount, right? Uh, but in exchange for that, they have maybe a little more churn and a little more overhead. But I don't see the growth uh, of, of for HBO and going this route. And in fact, uh, you could see attrition. Um, and wow. they, they certainly don't have the budget to defend and protect their content supply long term. And they don't own the rights to international distribution. And it'll take them years to develop, you know, and hold on to enough content so they can be a real player internationally. So I have problems seeing the scale. Mm -hmm. I really have trouble seeing HBO being able to get the scale to be at the top of the chart in terms of direct consumer subscribers. Right, they're at about 34 million domestic right no, now. Right. You don't seem to think they can grow that much beyond that. Well, they've been, they've been offering essentially the same service now for 25 years. So if that's at about the same retail price, because don't forget, it's, it's an a la carte service. It's been that way for years. So my view would be if you wanted HBO, you got it. I, I don't see whether the fact that now you can get it uh, uh, over the top, it may defend uh, what would otherwise be a shrinking base, but uh, because if you want a cord cut now, you have another way to keep seeing HBO. But doesn't it also threaten TNT and TBS in a way from the traditional bundle? I mean, isn't it? Well, the traditional bundle is under pressure. Uh, it's shrinking rapidly in the case of the satellite distributors. Uh, it's One owned by at and of yes, course. Much slower in the case of the cable bundle distributors, yep. but still shrinking. So, uh, yeah, I think all of the linear services are, are uh, under pressure. And I think market caps reflect that. Yeah, all right, so you were taking me four or five years out when I initially asked who the winners would be. Oh, right. You mentioned Netflix and Disney certainly is. Uh, where would AT&T be then in that time frame? Um, you know, I, I think AT&T has a challenge. I mean, you lived this movie before. You were deeply involved in it. You were on the board. You sold them that to That was a different AT&T. It, it was. It was. See yeah. Michael Armstrong. But there is yeah. a benefit to having been around a while. I mean, there are some people who feel like they've seen this movie before. It's a tough game. And AT&T, historically, has been the far and away the biggest dog in every fight, right? But not now and not in this space. So, uh, you know, I, I think they're, they're going to face challenges like everybody else is about scale and, and globality. You know, unless, unless you can supplement your U.S. base with global uh, expansion, it's going to be very hard to get enough scale to compete in this game. I mean, that's the way I look at it. So uh, I think that's a real challenge. Uh, I think HBO over the years has been terrific in the content creation. It's, it's made great stuff. Uh, but what it didn't do is develop a distribution platforms outside the U.S. that were meaningful. Right, which is the key for Netflix and for Disney. And it's and, all about global scale. Yeah. Look at all of the all of the fan companies, you know, are global. They're, you know, they're harvesting, uh, you know, what is it, Facebook has three billion users? I mean, if you're only in the U.S., how do you compete? Yeah. Um, let, me, uh, let me sort of end on these platforms with my parent company and just get your thoughts yeah. on Peacock, a different route being taken by yeah. Comcast yeah. in terms of an ad-supported spending money but not nearly at the level or ramping at the level that some of these others right. are. You think that's a smart strategy? Uh, it may be the only strategy that's available to essentially backfill what's happening with the decline of the big bundle, right? Uh, and also getting smart on targeted advertising, being able to uh, generate more revenue from fewer viewers because you know more about the viewers, right? I think that's an important ingredient there. If you can keep the price low and the quality uh, addictive, I think you, you hold mass distribution. And, uh, you know, 
obviously the big bundle is held together by sports. Right. Right. And so you, you sort of have to forecast what's going to happen with the big sports. Um, are they going to go ultimately direct consumer or are they going to continue to be the glue uh, that holds together the big bundle? What do you think? Well, eventually it blows up. I'm not sure I can predict when because it's still generating enormous amounts of economics for the NFL and... We got an NFL they, deal. They'll start yeah. renegotiating it pretty soon. Expectations yeah. are Fox and CBS. I mean, talk about traditional players will come out with, with something. Well, it, it's about the only thing that's really, really gives market power to these otherwise commoditized services, right? Uh, I mean, there's only one NFL, there's only one NBA. So if you're a sports fan, you know, you're going to go to the distributor that's giving you that sport if you're a sports fan. Now, maybe only 25% of the public is sports fans, but the distributors can't afford, you know, to not carry CBS if they're a sports fan. So we're still in that situation where uh, the big bundle is overpriced to the consumer because it's carrying a lot more sports content than the average consumer is interested in, average consumer. But the marginal consumer that really loves sports, he'll switch if he doesn't get what he wants. And that's what gives the sports distributing company the leverage. Right, and the power. Um, in terms of what's being spent on content right now, right. you mentioned it, at what point do you think things will begin to rationalize? Uh, Will there be a point at which, you know, can Netflix really spend $14 billion a year from now till forever? Can Amazon continue to spend? I know you said they at least have the ability to sort of go up and down. Disney, uh, you know, at what point do we get to, well, this is just too much and, and things start to collapse? Right. Uh, I think that the number of people trying to do scripted programming on a global basis and buying this content away from each other uh, will thin out as some people make it and some don't. At some point, some of the players are going to look at the numbers and they're going to say, you know, we no longer have belief that if we, th that Hail Mary passes are going to keep working. Reed, you know, who's, who's been brilliant. Reed Hastings. Yeah. He's been throwing Hail Mary passes since he started, right? And it's worked for him. Uh, and now he has a budget that's huge, bigger than anybody else's. Over time, he'll have to, he'll have to turn the dials to modulate that spend uh, to where he has a really good business that doesn't churn out on him. Uh, people will start experimenting with bundling with other services to reduce churn, to make it more sticky. Distributors will start bundling on behalf of some of these people if, if in fact, that reduces churn and, and makes the, the composite more desirable, more sticky. Right. And so it'll evolve the same way that the cable business did and the, the big bundle was created, right? And as those new packages are created, the guys who have uniqueness will start extracting more and more share. The prices will go up and we'll see this play again. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not mentioning it for our viewers, yeah. of course, to understand. You, you're not just meant talking about this idly. You obviously own a significant stake in Charter, so you see it from the distribution side. Significant stake in Discovery, so you see it from the content side. Internationally, and, we see it. And internationally with Liberty Global yeah. uh, as well. Um, when you think about cord cutting right now, right. you know, everybody's like, oh my God, it's just going to continue right, at this right. rate. We've watched the losses right. at Direct and at, and at Dish in particular. Right, right. Does it start to level off at some point? Yes, I think it does. Um, it doesn't stop, the erosion doesn't stop completely, but it'll make a transition to where, in my opinion, these distributors will start becoming where you go for a bundle of of other services. So you may not buy the big bundle, but you might end up buying a service from HBO or Netflix, or Netflix already is distributed by most cable operators, right? right? Uh, as an incremental service. Uh, 
Certainly Prime is talking to the distributors about a similar relationship. Uh, my guess is Disney will eventually, you know, be willing to provide some split in order to be in a bundle if, if that reduces churn or helps, helps uh, distribution. My, you know, discovery will be in that situation over time. So, you know, this will be a transition. It won't be a black and white thing. Um, right at the moment, because the video margins for the U.S. cable distributors are thin and getting thinner as more and more retrans pressure and, you know, sports pricing pressure comes in, uh, it's been sort of discovered that that actually margins improve as you lose video customers and you're, you become less capital intensive. And so if you shrink uh, the video base and don't try and innovate the video platform, right, your margins go up, right. your capex goes down, your levered free cash flow goes up, and your stock takes off. Right, so are that's you describing, what we see with Charter. Do you see with Charter? Because Tom, I think, though, would say it's not like we want to get out of the video business. No, no. It's a natural phenomenon that's happening, but the margins in broadband are much higher, right? If you're not trying to support the video package with your desirable broadband connection, you have more pricing power on broadband and much less capital intensity. So nature is kind of pushing it that way, and the equity markets, Moffat and Nathanson, for instance, right, I know. Craig you know, about kind this. of focused on that, and you can see that. Now, I think you want to provide your consumers, if you're a charter, with everything they want to get off of your network. So you want to accommodate your customers. You want to make it easy, even if you don't get a split, you want to make it easy for your customers to go from your video service to other people's video service. Uh, you know, because that's sticky. Uh, even if the video component's contribution to your profitability is, is going down and is skinny, mm -hmm. if it helps you drive your penetration of your communication services, you know, wired and wireless, it's, a, it's a, still a favorable thing to offer. Right. But you are of the opinion that we are going to see essentially slowly, but a leveling off to a certain extent in cord cutting. Not that it's going to stop. Of course it will continue, but not yeah, at the rates. Well, for one thing, David, the satellite guys will shrink down to a base of people who don't have alternatives. Uh, the rural marketplace, um, case in point, I have a number of places out in the country, ranches, right. where the only way we can get television, meaningful television, is satellite. So, you know, we're good, you know, and our choices are Charlie or, or AT&T. So, you know, uh, so in that part of the marketplace, and who knows what size that is, Charlie has always maintained that that's his base. That that base, as long as he serves that base and has a higher market share in that base than his competitor, it used to be DirecTV, that he's going to be okay. That's his core. And he might churn off over time the people who have these other internet alternatives. Right. I mean, his last quarter, the numbers started to come in yeah. in terms of losses yeah. were a lot less than they had been. Well, and Sling is starting to work. Right. And Sling is the over yeah. the top. So, to so I think... He's pretty I, focused on nationwide wireless right now. Well, but Charlie has reached an asymptote, I think, on, on his uh, business. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll stabilize. How about Direct? Well, Direct focused more on the metros, uh, you know, and... Uh, so I think they have a ways to go before they hit that same asymptote. Um, I mean, it's still a very cash generative business for AT and T. So it still generates you know, four billion in free cash flow. I think so when they lose customers, where they have, you know, uh, it's painful to their overall cash flow. What they had hoped, I think, was that they would those customers would go over to DSL and buy the same packages from them terrestrially, but they've lost, I think, the terrestrial war, or at least for the time being they've lost it, because they're not even growing on the, on the terrestrial side. u or whatever it was. Well, the that. cable guys are basically right. taking share away from, from the incumbents, let's call them, uh, terrestrially. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the game that's going on,
And right now the market is valuing that broadband connectivity at a much higher multiple than they are these other distribution mm -hmm. uh, businesses. Even though those other ones are profitable, the market seems to not think that they have a long-term future. What if you are a linear cable network right now, right. and you're reliant on obviously your subscriber fee and, and advertising, right. your universe is declining, um, you might even be able to charge more for ads, but can you keep up or is o overall things coming down for you? Uh, well, I think you're, I would call those strong headwinds. So, so to the degree that you can move some of your reach to direct consumer, then the kind of consumer information and feedback you get uh, makes your advertising more valuable, okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind. So a hybrid solution where 70% of your customers are receiving you in a linear way, and the other 30% of your viewers are getting you through some or other bundle. Through an app or something like through that? Through an app, yes, through an app. Uh, or as part of some over-the-top bundle or indirectly because your content with its commercials are embedded in somebody else's service like might happen with Peacock, uh, your ad revenue potential goes up to the degree you can play in the game of, of more focused advertising. But by so, doing that, do you threaten the traditional distribution of your product? Well, I, it's, to me, it's the tail wagging the dog. No, I think the, the big bundle is going to do what the big bundle is going to do, and it's very hard to fight that, okay? Yeah. So what, what a programmer, this linear programmer you're talking about, needs to do is figure out how, when people cut the cord, the consumer still has access to their programming. So they do it by an app, by a, you know, random access, streaming, bundle with somebody else, resell your content through somebody else for that marketplace. You, 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 you really got to fight that decline of your reach, okay? So is that what you're encouraging Discovery to do? Very much so, yeah, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, one is already Discovery has uh, a random access services. So if you're, uh, if you're getting Discovery product through Charter, for instance, you also automatically have access to random access of, of Discovery product through an app. So, you know, and right now that's a pretty big and growing business for Discovery. You can't get all their programming that way, you can, but you can get House and Garden if that's what you want, or you can get you know, ID if that's what you want, and so on. Uh, it's a little cumbersome still, and you have to already be an authenticated Subscriber. customer right. of either a satellite guy or a cable guy. So right now it's value added. It's intended to be a little glue, but as an advertising uh, a generator, it's, it's, it's very nice. But would you encourage them to have an app that aggregates all their content in yeah, direct to consumer? Absolutely, way? I would. But I would also encourage them to continue to do it as a value added service for those people who are still in the big bundle and only make it a direct consumer product for those people who have already made the decision to cut, cut the cord on, on the distributor. And I would also encourage them to look to their existing distributors to be partners in that. Because those existing distributors, to the degree they want to stay in the video delivery business, will start to offer bundles of direct consumer products. Right. Which so I could see a world in which Discovery yeah. and HBO, for instance, are bought by people who have already cut the cord from Charter. Right. But they'll buy it through Charter. Right. So they'll buy Charter Broadband will offer them that product essentially. Yes. Right. As, as a bundled product. Yeah, uh, it, it, and, the margins, and I think the margins? hopefully this time, yeah. uh, the distributors will avoid the, the, what I call the ESPN trap. Which, which is? Which is you carry one, you carry all, right? Which has really forced the cable product to be overpriced. So, you know, in these new bundles, the, the splits may be smaller, but you should be able to control that over time. Uh, as opposed to being sort of locked into a margin shrink structure.
Um, the, world, the world of cable, as you know, David, changed when the Congress passed retransmission consent. Yes. From that day on, video margins in the cable industry started to shrink. And the guys who owned the important programming were able to extract more and more of the profitability on the video side. Right, so isn't this world a lower margin world you're describing? It is, but larger scale. And it's also a world where different people make their profitability from different services. Right. <clears throat> so if you're a cable distributor, most of your profitability is going to come out of the broadband connection. Okay, A little bit incremental profitability is going to come out of other services you offer with that that are optional, uh, but those services will also be glue, customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if customers would like to buy their cellular connection from one guy, and, and they've got to have their broadband, so why isn't it logical for the broadband guy to offer cellular? Right. If they really want Netflix, right, why isn't it sense for the broadband guy to also offer Netflix? So it's kind of convenience, right? But the world you create, you help yeah. create, yeah. that incredibly profitable world yeah. is finally going away. The I dual mean, stream, uh, well, look, the best business model in the world is a monopoly. <laughs> right. Okay. So, but the cable business ceased being a monopoly when satellite came in to compete with cable, okay? Then but it's it became, been a heck of a great business if you're a content provider through the It's existed, created a lot of wealth. Existed. Yes, it's it created has. a lot of wealth for content guys as well as distributors. Yes, that world is definitely changing. Okay. Will the new world that we've spent now last year apart talking about during our conversation and now this one, will it be as profitable as the old one? It will for people who have a, a unique or at worst duopoly kind of situation, right? Where, where their services are in demand consistently, stably, uh, where they have some pricing power because of that, uh, and where they have a level of uniqueness, okay? Um, th those businesses that have those characteristics, after going through a lot of noise, will ultimately be nicely profitable. And those businesses usually ultimately end up regulated, okay? Um, you know, the, if you're, the, the curse of life is if you get too successful, then the politicians decide to regulate yeah, well, you. Well, it hasn't happened to Facebook or Google yet. It will. It will. I know, you, as you, we all well know, you're a libertarian, but do you think that they deserve to be regulated? Uh, if they abuse their, their dominance. So as long as they're serving the consumer, and the argument could be made that, that they're driving down consumer cost and driving up consumer optionality, yes. At the point they become uh, predatory, right, on other businesses in order to exclude other businesses from being successful. Yeah. Then I think government ultimately will step in are and we say, at wait that, a minute. Are we at that point? Well, if you're talking about search, search is a monopoly as a practical matter today. So, so if, if Google, for instance, which owns dominant search, uh, starts to offer services that are competitive, that they own, that are competitive with, with other services for which they search, sooner or later, okay, the, right. there's going to have to be a level playing ground created either by Google's discipline, self-discipline, or by external forces forcing. But you, as an owner of Trip Advisor, yeah, right. we saw this a few weeks ago, and Expedia, yeah. well you don't own yeah. Expedia, but yeah. we saw they changed, yeah. search, they changed yeah. the algorithm. But they'll get away with that if, if their algorithm shifts uh, from OTAs to, to hotel chains, right? As long as Google doesn't own it. Right. But in my view, if Google starts to own an OTA, and starts to favor their own OTA against uh, third-party OTAs in their search algorithms for reasons that are essentially driven by profitability and not by, uh, by consumer interest, then I think government steps in. I, I think it's, these, these guys have been enormously successful and they're gonna have to have self-discipline because otherwise their dominant position can be abused. You know, look, there was a point when, when 
the cable guys, and I led most of the cable efforts, had so much control over success or failure of cable networks, right, that the government intervened. Right. And if you remember, at one point they said, I couldn't own an interest in more than 30% of the cable channels that I carry, right? Well, that was pretty punitive when we had 30 channels, but it became wide open when there were 500, mm -hmm. okay? So, but that was a government mm -hmm. intervention we had price regulation for a period of time, then that went away, but then we had content market share regulation. We have antitrust guys telling Brian that if he was to buy Time Warner, that was too much market share and too powerful. No, I think, I think look, it's a legitimate role of governments to look at these issues and to keep competition and, right. well, and innovation alive. We're talking about too much power, I mean, yeah. Think about the power. You don't need to. You know the power these platforms have, yeah, yeah. whether it's Amazon, Alphabet, or Facebook. Right. And the more successful they are, eventually they run into government uh, concern. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's if you get so powerful, you can decide who wins democratic elections. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's too much power for a private enterprise to have. The same. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a legitimate balance between the regulatory power of government and the entrepreneurial creativity of smart people. I mean, it's a balance. Right. So, oh. I, you know, I, I, I think these guys have done a tremendous job of building what they've built. And, and the issue is, at what point do they run into a, a government? Look at Bill Gates with 92% market share in, in computers, right? Software. Yeah. yeah right. Uh, at some point, they said, hey, you can't just stomp out Netscape. Right. Right? It's just not fair, Bill. You know? And his life changed. It did. Right? It so did. he was too successful. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of scale and global scale, you've made it clear that in order to sort of be as profitable as a content company, right. or just, right. you need global scale. <clears throat> right. um, <clears throat> what about these companies? I mean, does Discovery have enough scale? Does CBS Viacom have enough scale? Do we need to see one more round of sort of consolidation among content providers? Well, I mean, uh, if you go back a couple years, you know, Discovery's the one I'm most familiar with. Of course. Right? 32 years, I think, now. But uh, we saw in scripts, for instance, a, a consolidation opportunity that would give a scale, uh, increase optionality, brands that we, that we understood, talent in the organization, opportunity for synergies of consolidation. Didn't solve the direct consumer issue, but gave us a lot more firepower. So that's worked out really well. And now Discovery is, you know, got an investment grade balance sheet, uh, leveraging quickly. Grade, deleverage quickly, generating give or take $3 billion a year in levered free after tax cash, right? So they got a lot of juice with which to solve their issues. Uh, they own all their content worldwide in all platforms. Uh, and they're pretty much the only global uh, company right at the moment whose products are in front of audiences on a global basis. So they've got a lot of the pieces, right? They need to make the transition from linear to uh, interactive IP direct consumer. Which is what we were talking about. In correct. Terms of That's correct. They need to... The hybrid need, approach. They need that hybrid approach. Uh, and they're reaching out in a lot of different ways. Uh, they brought in some extremely highly talented people from Am ex-Amazon guys to help them with this direct consumer opportunity. And uh, I personally am willing to bet that they're going to make this transition. Well, you bet a little nicely. more even earlier this week. You, I did. You, well, actually, it was a pretty big purchase for you. What, 2.6 million shares? Uh, 75 million bucks. Yeah. I wrote the check, yeah. Why'd you uh, do it now? I believe, uh, I believe that uh, they will solve these issues and that they are dramatically undervalued right now. When I put my screen up and I look at companies based upon market cap versus levered free cash flow, they were the cheapest thing on the screen. And I said, wait a minute, you know, they've, they're growing in a world where everybody else is shrinking. They're, they own all their content. 
They're generating a ton of cash. They're an investment grade balance sheet. Why are they, why are they cheap? And what is the multiple on free cash? It's, it's really low, right? Low six, six times, probably six, five, and five, half, five and a half times cash. So, right. so that's giving them like a 16, 17% cash return, right? After tax. So that's pretty darn cheap for a good company. So I said, yeah, I think I'll buy some more. I started buying it when the Scripps deal was, got a thumbs down from the market. So I bought some in the teens. Uh, then I bought some more in the very low 20s. And now I'm buying some, I think I paid 2803 for the shares that I bought. Uh, and uh, so I've increased my, my exposure to discovery. Uh, and I did it because I believe I'm going to make money, but I also did it as a pat on the back for the management team there that I think is doing a terrific job, even if the market is not recognizing it yet. Our friend, uh, my friend as well, David Zaslav. Well, you could say the same, or some might want to say the same about CBS Viacom. About to get together, that deal will close a matter of weeks from now, John. It's trading not quite as cheaply, but very cheaply as well on those same multiples. Is that also something you think is being undeservedly penalized by the by the by investors? I think it's cheap at the moment. Uh, what they don't have is global presence. Uh, while they make a lot of their own content and own a lot of their own content, a lot of it is bought. <clears throat> and the real locomotive in that whole collection is CBS, and CBS is totally dependent, in my opinion, on sports rights and the guys who own sports rights know that so I'm not sure about long-term profitability or whether or not uh, CBS has enough market power to carry all of those channels right and so my guess is that at least at the affiliate level uh, what Sherry's going to face is, is uh, uh, fights over pricing on affiliate fees. As they face ever-increasing rates right. from the NFL or yeah. the NCAA. And so kind of the threat that you won't get CBS and the New York Giants game, you know, if you don't agree to carry 12 channels uh, and pay for them, at some point that rubber brand, the rubber band breaks, right? And I think, in my own opinion, now I, Sherry's going to be mad at me for saying this, but I think Viacom underinvested in the content on their channels for a number of years while they were spending their money buying back stock at high prices. And I think that was kind of a tactical mistake. Uh, in fact, I think, I think Sumner made a mistake when he split the two companies. Uh, because they really always belong together. And had it evolved together, there would have been more juice invested in those niche categories that really are sticky. Now, you know, you got to say, how important is MTV to a distributor? How important is, uh, is Nickelodeon to a distributor? Uh, you know, when I see them essentially licensing SpongeBob, their best program to other people, uh, I worry about, about you know, the sustainability of the model and the fact that they're U.S. only. Right. So they don't get a lot of uh, support internationally to help them pay for their content. So, uh, you know, yes, historically they are very cheap histor against historical comps. Do they benefit in a sense, though, from the content wars, from the enormous amounts being spent, if they can be an arms supplier into so many of those? Very much services? so, but that's a dichotomy. Do you put your own programming on your own networks, or do you sell it to the highest? Right. If you don't put it in your own networks, you're going to, you're going to melt faster. I know, but it's such an interesting world now because Warner is going to be essentially producing content for HBO Max, right. Disney's and Fox the but those studios, are verticals. Right, are going to be producing. Verticals. But if they give up selling it to the other guy's army, yeah. they're not an arms merchant. Right. They're going into a defensive. Not, that's my point. So they're, but aren't you going to be benefiting then from being the one who can sell to everybody? Well, if you're postured to do that, I mean, if you're just a studio, or forget about studio, because studio concept's going away too. If you're just a, 
a, a guy with great intellectual uh, property and you can sell it to anybody you want to sell it to and everybody's willing to underwrite you to produce it. You're in a catbird seat right now. Talent right now is a huge beneficiary, whether it's the writer or the actor. Right now, it's as good as it's ever going to get when you got four or five deep pocket guys negotiating for your services or your products, right? That's good. So for those people, this is wonderful. But if, if, you're, if you're challenged where, if you don't put your own best ideas on your own distribution, okay, yeah. everybody's gonna see that and gonna say, oh, they're cheapening their product. Right. Right. But you in may order not have to a, make money off something else. Understood, but you may not have enough robust product to support a direct-to-consumer business on your own. Correct. So you may evolve to just be a, a producer of product for other people, and the margins in that are pretty thin, and you don't get any tail end. So that doesn't sound good to me. I don't think that's a good place to be. I don't think, you know, when Netflix comes to you and says, we want you to make this for us, we're going to own it. Okay, we'll pay you a 10% above cost spread, Right, but you have no ownership, no. That's a shitty model. That's that's manufacturing widgets. Right, right. right. Not a great wealth builder. So, so, so you know, if you're making stuff driving your own business, and your own business is growing and becoming more and more profitable, bigger and bigger, you got an asset. If in the old days, if you made programming. If you were a studio and you made programming for even Netflix, right? They had the first the front the first run, and you've got it. You back. had the back end. If they make it popular in syndication, all of a sudden you've got a valuable accumulating asset. That's gone away, right? That opportunity isn't there for the pure producers of content. So when they sell it, they better get the best price possible uh, from some third party because they're not going to get a back end. Right, right. So does that mean the future for CBS Viacom, that they need to get even bigger, that there's got to be another deal down the road for them? I, I, I honestly think if they're going to be a long-term player, they have to figure out how to get global instead of domestic only. And they're going to have to focus on the niches that, that they have some level of uniqueness in, right? In order to have glue, in order to get that subscriber to pay that 10 bucks a month for CBS Plus or add Showtime to it for another CBS 10 bucks. All Access. All right. Access, yeah. whatever it is. Right. Whatever bundle you're offering, you're going to have to compete with the other people selling essentially the same thing. So you got to have a level of uniqueness or uh, in order to differentiate. Yeah. Um, we talked about your purchase of Discovery and your support, obviously, yeah. from the management team. I wanted to ask quickly about a couple of things that you don't own anymore. Sure. Lionsgate. Right. Why did you sell it? Uh, I sold it because I, I didn't see them execute uh, a strategy of, of using their library and content capabilities to drive stars. I really thought the opportunity was to take stars, use Lionsgate's creative skills to drive stars globally, uh, aggressively. And they got, tra in my opinion, they got hung up on selling our content to somebody else versus putting on our own distribution. I, my concept originally when I went into it was that they were going to drive their own distribution. I also thought that if they were successful in that, they would make themselves much more valuable to other people. Okay? Uh, and I, I think that they didn't do that. Uh, and I became discouraged uh, with their ability to do that. Now, they, they, they seem to be gaining some traction now outside the U.S. in distribution. Um, and they've gained some traction in the U.S. with Amazon as a, as a marketer for stars. Um, it was just, uh, you know, it was the question you started with. Right. You know, who's going to win in the streaming game? And I didn't see a path for that company to be a winner in that space. If they, if they didn't merge with somebody else. They were uh, close to, I mean, CBS before the Viacom deal was pretty close to And everything. maybe still. 
Yeah. Maybe still Showtime and Stars should get together because there's enormous synergy in that combination and that would provide scale. Right. But it, this is a scale game and you, you've got to be global to get scale in, in that scripted game. Or you've got to drive yourself toward narrow niches where you have uniqueness because the big guys don't care about that niche. You've got to go one way or the other. Um, another name that you own, we talked a little bit about the OTAs, Expedia. Yeah. You don't really own that anymore either. You sold Well, we, we, uh, our holding company, which, which uh, owned a, a large stake in Expedia, merged into Expedia earlier this year. Right. So Liberty shareholders all ended up with Expedia shares directly. So we dispersed the Liberty shares to the Liberty shareholders. And then it was up to each shareholder to decide whether, you know, where what they, do. what to do. I was, of course, one of those shareholders. Yeah. So I ended up with a stake in Expedia. Which you sold. Which I'm not, a, I'm not required to disclose what I did, but the reality is I've sold most of them. Why? I was, uh, it was very opportunistic. I think it's a good business. Uh, it's still a very cash generative business, even with this Google change. But in all honesty, I had a large tax loss this year from Lionsgate, <laughs> which sheltered the gain that I had from selling a stake in Expedia. So it was very just opportunistic. So now I have the cash. Now I've got to decide whether I want to go back into a much less expensive Expedia, which I may well do. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right. It's well, it had that horrible day on that when they reported those numbers. They did. So I have enorm ugly. enormous faith in Barry and and his ability to figure things out. Right. It may be that these these travel companies faced with Google's change start to focus their valuation metric on on levered free cash flow instead of growth. I mean, the growth days may be coming to an end, but they are enormously profitable. Very low capex, right? And uh, so if the metric changes and they drive toward that metric, they could, they could well see valuations come back up. Um, in the brief time we have left, John, we mentioned Charter a bit, um, well, quite a bit, but I, I'm curious on the wireless front, which is becoming a more important component of their business. Yes. Um, and we mentioned Charlie Ergen and I, you know, his, his opportunity in terms of being a 5G nationwide yeah, provider yeah. if the Sprint deal happens. Yeah. If that deal doesn't happen, if T-Mobile and Sprint are held up by right. the state AGs, do you think Charter would have interest in Sprint? Is there something more than just an MVNO that Charter should be doing when it comes to wireless? Well, let me back up a couple of notches, okay? okay. In, in Europe, uh, you know, in my other life, Liberty uh, Global, Liberty Global we, we followed a strategy of believing that the consolidation of wired and wireless networks created enormous synergy, you know, convenience for the consumer, all kinds of good things. And our strategy there was to do MVNOs initially, right? Resell other people's service until we got scale. Once we had scale, we were able to calculate pretty carefully the economics of us acquiring one of the other networks. Uh, so in Belgium, for instance, we did that. In Holland, we essentially combined with Vodafone in order to do that. We found those synergies to be real and very substantial. So in the U.S., the strategy, I think, for a charter would be to continue to grow based upon reselling other people's services, not make a huge capital intensive bet yet, right? Until we really understood the dynamic uh, the economics of, of the, co the combination, how sticky it was, how much the consumers liked it or didn't like it, what kind of pricing power it gave us. At the point that we get material, we would be in a better position to answer that question about should we buy or build our own network. Um, at the moment, I don't think we're far enough along that path and in this case, I almost use we as Charter and Comcast, mm -hmm. because the two companies are working together on this effort. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there will be a point when we will have enough volume, enough scale, enough traffic, when we can make an intelligent decision about building, building some of our own network 
so that the MVNO is more cost effective on our, on our footprint for some parts of our footprint than others. So there'll be a hybrid transition over time. Now Altice here in New York has already done that right. to some degree so that they can offload a heavy cellular traffic onto their own radios, their own network, and optimize against the relationship that they have, in their case with Sprint. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's a learning curve and as we as as the cable industry and the you know the terrestrial network understands that relationship, there will be a coming together. It might be joint ventures, it might be mergers, uh, right. but there will be a coming together because the economics will drive it there. Interesting. You mentioned Altice. Do you think Drahi would have interest in selling uh, Altice USA if, to well, charter, for example? If I, I I. I I don't have enough fingers to count the number of times I've talked to a Patrick about this. Right. Uh, sure. There's a lot of synergy in, in, uh, in LTs getting together with Charter or Comcast, frankly. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, I think Patrick is, is uh, wanting to have a level of control. Uh, and he's willing to pay a premium to get control but he's too small a footprint. He can't so, buy charter. He's well, that's the point. Yeah, he's the point. I know he might like to, but I mean, no, it's got to be the other way. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, he's a very ambitious and smart guy. Yeah. Right? His purchase of Sotheby's, you should look at that, right? I mean, it's... You think it's a good, the Sotheby's deal is a, the personal purchase by Drahi of Sotheby's. What? You're smiling. What's I that? think he stole it. You do? Yeah, I think he did. I mean, in the sense that, that he ends up with it and it cost him very little why, the way why he financed he, it, the way he structured it. Why do you say that? Uh, I've been, it's been explained to me how, how, why it was worth. What do you pay, four bills, something like that? Three and a half. Three and a half? Yeah. But my understanding is there was a lot of real estate, there were a lot of receivables, uh, there was a lot of overhead, and when he's done with it, he'll sort of own it for free. Right. He's a very smart guy. He is. So, okay, so, he calls you all the time. What is he, is he really trying to like get you to sell him charter? I mean, yeah. you can't do that deal. Well, no, I mean, look, we have a lot of things to talk about because we're in the same business, right? Both U.S. domestic as well as international. So there's a lot of note comparisons. Uh, you know, his view is that, that if you ran charter the way he runs Altice, U.S., uh, you could take the margins up by seven or eight more uh, basis points. You know, he, that there's a lot of juice that his approach to life uh, would uh, generate. And, uh, you know, and he's kind of proven that it works, at least for now, in cable vision, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, he's ha he can't really grow cable vision much. He would say it's a mature market, uh, whereas Charter is still growing very nicely, thank you. Uh, and and so the dynamics in those two businesses are somewhat different, right? Yeah. I mean, when you stop growing, then you try and generate all the cash you can. But when you're growing, you know, the growth makes up for a lot of, uh, of, of margin difference. Well, it's a different conversation we have now about Charter this year, yeah. given the performance of the stock price. Yeah. A year ago, I wouldn't say you were frustrated, but there'd been some M&A possibilities. They weren't taken. You let Rutledge do his thing. Um, I'm a big fan of but it's, Rutledge. I mean, the stock is at all-time highs. Though. Yeah. Sure. Rutledge has had a clear vision of what he wanted to do, uh, and he's executed it. And he's not gotten distracted. He's not wanted to go do uh, a sprint deal or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I mean, we never could get Lowell uh, McAdam up above about, I think he was in the low to mid 300 bucks a share and look where the stock is right, now. So, 70s, right? yeah. so, you know, uh, Tom, I think, believed that if he was persistent with his strategy, if our capital strategy continued, right, levered a uh, shrink, right. uh, that he could achieve very high per share values. And he's demonstrating that. And uh, I don't see anything that's taken him off of that pathway. So You're lucky you didn't do the Masa deal if that was ever real. Well, you know, that was hard. Yeah. That was hard. You know, I like Masa, but Masa so 
he flings these numbers around awful easy. You know? yes. he sure and, does. Uh, well, he's got a 300 year vision, John, so you know. Yeah, and he's got a balance sheet nobody can understand. <laughs> so, you know. I mean, he's had some home runs, no question. He has. He so, has. Difficult, more difficult times right now for SoftBank. Sir. Yeah, he took some big, some big rides, and, and some of them are not performing for him. So, you know, at the moment. Uh, but those are cycles. You think so? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I look at each one of these deep loss businesses that if we, you know, it's the old hot dog story. You know, if I lose 10 cents on every hot dog I sell, I'll make it up in scale. Right. Well, it doesn't work. So you've got to have an argument that scale is going to improve the marginal economics. And, uh, you know, I never quite understood Uber and I never quite understood why Dara took the job. You didn't? I didn't. It was a hell of a challenge. And he's a very good guy. So, yeah. you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. It's fascinating with Uber in particular, back SoftBank, just in terms of my coverage. I mean, they're funding, some, they're their biggest investor, yet they're funding some of their competitors, which are forcing, forcing them yeah. to lose money, whether right. it's Didi in Latin America or DoorDash in terms yeah. of competing yeah. with Uber Eats. Lots of shotgunning. Yeah. And maybe he thinks these will all combine at some point to get scale, right? And meanwhile, you're sort of capturing volume and ultimately, uh, you put them together and, and you've got, the problem is your asset is your drivers. Right. And if the drivers run work for two or three different digital players, it's not really your asset. You don't like Uber's business model, I'm gathering. Well, I think if it was tweaked in some ways, it could be very good. But they, they really need to capture those drivers even if it costs them something, right? So that they're not, moving around so that scale really means something. You know, if I've got 70% of all of the cars in a, a metro area, customers are going to want to use me because I'm going to provide better service. Right. And drivers are going to like that because ultimately they're going to make more money. But right now in a world where you have three or four competitors in a metro, all and drivers working for all of them, I don't see I don't see where scale changes the economics. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. But I don't know the business that well. Uh, but you were surprised he took the job. That's I was surprised he took the job. He did such a great job at Expedia. Um, you know. Um, but I think the challenge got him. Yeah. The upside potential, you know. Finally, um, it's been a couple of years since we've sort of talked about you in terms of your uh, philanthropic ambitions yeah. and things like that. I think you're the largest landowner in the United States uh -huh. at this point. How do you think about things? Are you thinking about them any differently than you did in terms of sort of what your plan is and, and how you're going about implementing it? I worry about, you know, political stability in the country. I really am bothered enormously by this attack on success and wealth. I think this is terrible. You know, when my w wife is worried about driving her car, down to the shopping center because somebody might think it's too nice a car. And so she drives an old pickup truck. You know, I, I worry about that. Mm -hmm. I worry about uh, values in this country. So that, that kind of gives me pause. I've been a big supporter of public charter schools, particularly in Denver. But now I see that the, uh, the school board there has now been taken over by the teachers union. Uh, you know, so I, I really worry about, about the country and where the country is going, broadly speaking. My land ambition was to, to create uh, a land base that was uh, open land, preservation, uh, you know, be politically correct, absorb carbon, mm -hmm. right? Use your land for uh, sustainable energy generation, windmills, solar, and so on. I, I believe in all that stuff. Invest in perennial agriculture so that you're not tearing the soils up to produce grains. All of those kind of things. Uh, and I just worry about whether or not the country has a long-term focus on itself. You know, what are we going to become 20 years from now? What kind of world are my grandkids going to live in? Um, so I worry about that. Yeah. And I don't see us spending at the, at the central government level nearly enough time 
thinking seriously about you know what the future looks like for the country uh, and uh, I wonder that we're going to have the leadership to you know to do a good job of this country going into the future that said I still believe enormously in philanthropy I think private money can do a lot of things that government can't do in medical research uh, education you know you can go out and create models right of how things really do work and then maybe broadly the society can adopt those so you know it's it's uh, it's that you know and uh, you know so you know my land is is going to be preserved and my forests are going to absorb carbon and my you know I mean it's it's straight ahead yep uh, if Elizabeth Warren wins the presidency, would you consider moving to I, some of those nice places you have in Ireland? Uh, well, I, I think if, if it goes in a socialist direction, my concern is the wealth destruction will far exceed the wealth transfer. Uh, you'll just collapse a lot of wealth creating uh, structures. And, and I think it would be pretty ugly, frankly. And I certainly, you know, I've, I've built a second life in Ireland. I've sort of got a second life in Canada. I have lots of alternatives. Uh, I got a, a lovely island in the Bahamas, you know. I mean, there's lots, lots of things, of, yeah. lots of other things, uh, other places in the world that you, that you could run to, but I'd rather stay here. Uh, I'd rather be optimistic about a balance. You know, I mean, should I would vote for Bloomberg, and I'm a libertarian, right? right? I mean, I don't know that he's got much of a chance, but I think, you know, a, a good, solid, uh, you know, look, I think a lot of the things Trump has, has tried to do, identifying problems and trying to solve them has been great. I just don't think he's the right guy to do it. Um, he just doesn't build a team. I think that's the number one problem. You know, half the people that he's hired and, and thrown under the bus are now trying to trying to kill him. Yeah. I mean, what kind of thing is that? It's chaos. So, you know, we got a great country. I think we have a great uh, system of laws. The Constitution should be protected at all costs. Uh, and uh, and I think we'll probably, you know, figure it out. But right now it's scary. Right now it's scary because it's because the political divisions in the country are so extreme that you don't see intelligent people sitting there and trying to work together to solve problems, which is really what government's supposed to do. Instead John, of fighting for power all the time, all the time. Um, well, a kind of hopeful note to end on, but always appreciate your taking time with us every year. Thank you. you. It's great seeing you. It's great you to see you. You never get older. Oh, please. Neither Come do on. you. My God. Yeah. Thank you, John. Take care of you.